Do you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, thank you for thank you very much for having me. And uh, this we have been talking about this kind of uh, session uh, when we were actually working on Center for the Arts to be involved more in your program and. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the pandemic actually prevented that, but uh, we will hopefully restart this uh, effort to uh, to merge our effort on Center for the Arts and maybe potentially uh, Discovery Partners Institute with the academic contribution we can do in your program. So this hopefully this will be a kind of kickoff, uh, mild kickoff for that. And. Uh, I'm sure the Zoom, Zoom is kind of uh, a bit difficult to get a sense of what kind of reaction I'm getting. So I'm a little bit uh, mm, becoming tired of this kind of format, but I think hopefully this office tour can uh, give you a little bit more live uh, sense of uh, what we are doing here. And I think when you see the, the office environment, I think it always gives you more, um, let's say, understanding of the, um, the firm's culture. Okay, um, so I will start, I will give like 30 minutes lecture and then the 30 minutes tour. Uh, but maybe I can get some kind of questions if after the lecture or even during the tour, you can interrupt me on the tour because we are casually going to show you the models and the office environment. Um, I came here to New York from Rotterdam uh, 2006, so almost like uh, 15 years ago, um, and have been working on many projects. If the office size fluctuated from five people to like 90 people, now we are about 60 people. Uh, doing many, all kinds of different typology and different scales, as you see here. Um, I would like to show maybe how maybe fun and flexible architectural practice is actually. Um, maybe surprising coming from a firm like us. But, uh, but what we do here is uh, in my kind of, this is a diagram that I made, but I think we are always interested in the general observation of the changes that are happening in the world, not necessarily linked to any kind of project per se. It's more like uh, our preoccupations or interests uh, that really speaks to us. Uh, but of course, each project is highly specific in terms of its givens and its, um, you know, um, the conditions like the client is always different, the site is different, the program is different, et cetera. Uh, so I think our architecture somehow uh, is in between the observation and uh, sorry, there's a noise, maybe people can mute. Um, um, there, our architecture somehow lies somewhere between this kind of general observation and highly specific conditions of each project. Uh, and then basically we use like models, sketches, diagrams, writing, books as a kind of means to bridge those uh, kind of domain. And then between observation and basically uh, representation, there's a kind of research and clarification. Of course, it's not a linear uh, process. We always go, go back and forth between like, let's say representation and observation is a little bit difficult and abstract. Uh, here, for example, an example of our beginning of, let's say, competition, like we create a kind of war room where a lot of information is basically kind of mapped onto a wall and then try to absorb as much condition as possible before we start designing. We don't try, we try not to start designing without having some level of understanding or research. Uh, and But of course, we once we go into a kind of formal uh, research, we produce a lot. I'm not actually proud of this uh, amount of options. We are actually always trying to reduce the amount of options and we encourage young architects to be more attached to what you propose rather than trying to show the um, 
um, let's say, possibilities of options. I always say it's easy to make options, but it's very difficult to decide or be attached to what you propose. So these are, for me, it's not a kind of how much, it's not a kind of proud slides, but it's actually uh, not a good culture we have here of producing so many, so many options. Um, in terms of clarifying the concept after those formal and research, uh, formal exploration and research, we try to explain the project with like, let's say one move, we often use hand to really kind of clarify what we have done in terms of program, the form is doing in, in relation to the program. Uh, this level of simplicity always brings the project into a, a kind of uh, a level of simplicity that can last uh, uh, very long and um, let's say um, uh, solid um, during the long architectural process. Um, our office, of course, it's highly collaborative. We don't really have so much hierarchy. It's quite active, uh, doing many all kinds of efforts and uh, some fun too. Um, but also it comes with a certain level of, of course, sacrifices and you see this kind of uh, scene, but we try also not to do this anymore. Um, so um, if you are interested, please apply to us. Uh, we are always open. Um, now I will uh, go into a project. Uh, this is a, a performing arts center in Miami Beach, which is so close to the beach, which is a developers uh, in a way a built project, but it's uh, adjacent to this um, Norman Foster's condominium in the hotel. Um, what we did was to claim a kind of center by having a cylindrical uh, plan and then also have two different volumes on one on the creek side and one on the beach side. And then merging the two volumes into one. So it looks like uh, two separate volumes, which is informed by this kind of urban condition where a lot of residential side of this Collins was uh, comp comprised of very smaller scale. So we didn't want to have one big building, but have uh, multiple smaller buildings. So it's like a two volumes attached to each other uh, that has a plan that also had contrasts one, one to the other. So one is uh, circular and one is more like rectangular. Also in section, one is more classical dome and one is more like a black box. What that could be used uh, as a singular space like this, or it could be used divided in the center and be have two simultaneous events. Uh, in Miami, we are, we've done, uh, we just finished uh, a residential buildings here, condominiums, three towers along the Coconut Groves uh, waterfront in front of the city hall, and then also a sculpture park. Uh, this is VIG's tower, it's the same client. Um, our tower is like a kind of more organic uh, shaped, which is informed by like having two cores so that every unit is approachable without any corridor. And we also um, externalize all the structure outside to become more of a, a privacy screen, but also wind, wind break, but also preserving the future flexibility of the units. So that defines the uh, building. So you can see those structures that are a little bit sculpted and undulating. This is from that park in front. Uh, you can see those structures. A uh, lot of Miami buildings actually create this kind of amazing balconies, but you, you hardly see people inhabiting because actually the wind is quite strong. We kind of analyze that uh, uh, environment. So these are actually working with the windbreak. So in our building, you see a lot of people hanging out on the terraces because those structure actually uh, breaks the wind. Uh, this is the building we finished in New York, 23rd Street and Lexington. Uh, this site was somewhere in between uh, Madison, Square, uh, Madison Square Park and the Gramercy Park. So we, we wanted to kind of express that confused identity. 
uh, by creating this kind of destabilized corner, which kind of stitches the, the scene, scenery around, as you can see, like a different reflections, somehow creates a stitched three-dimensional corner and create new identity rather than relying on a confused identity. You can see there are uh, very old buildings adjacent to the, our site. So the, the facade actually transitioned from punched window to more open corner. Uh, we are uh, uh, our new Tiffany flagship store on 57th and uh, Fifth Avenue. Uh, we've done the, um, the internal restoration and also new interior, but also adding a, a, a penthouse, which is the event space and the VIP space at the top. Uh, the site is sandwiched by the Trump Tower here on your right, and then the IBM headquarters which both looked very masculine. So we were inspired by this cornice, as you can see a bit kind of original organic kind of cornice detail. Uh, also uh, having some kind of, some level of organic or femininity uh, through this slumped glass that looks like a curtain as opposed to very hard uh, curtain wall uh, around. These are the mock-ups. Uh, this is looking down to the Fifth Avenue to the south and which is under construction now. Uh, of course, this was a very charged site, as you might know, because uh, it was right next to the Trump's uh, the headquarter. Um, we are about to finish uh, a synagogue extension in LA in Wilshire Drive. As you can see, this is one of the most uh, prominent synagogue in LA, and this is a new event space uh, next to it. Uh, we were asked to deliver some kind of a box. We thought that uh, we should pay some kind of respect to the temple, having buffer zone. Also, there is a historically preserved school. So we also uh, swayed away from that. That generated our form uh, and created an event space on the ground that echoes the dome of the temple that really acts like a vault space that connects the Wilshire Drive to the courtyard of the historic school behind, almost like a kind of a thoroughfare. And then also a, a big terrace that faces and frames the stained glass window of the existing church like this. Uh, and the rooftop uh, sunken garden, also rooftop is an event space too. So it's like an event machine, those three, uh, voids are interconnected and have views one to the other. So this is a vault space. You can look up and have a, uh, to, uh, to have a site to the dome uh, from this um, terrace uh, of the chapel space that frames the stained glass window. You can uh, have a view to the roof. And then from this uh, roof, you can also look down all the way to the uh, event space on the ground. Um, this is a foyer. Uh, the facade is uh, uh, one unit, basically a hexagon with one rectangular window, but we rotate it according to the program behind that generated this kind of uh, uh, pattern uh, that echoes the kind of hexagonal pattern of the, uh, the dome inside the dome, which is coming from this uh, Jewish pattern. Uh, so this is about to be uh, completed. You can see the GFRC panel that has this kind of vertical pattern. So by rotating it, it captures different lighting. So these panels are the same color. It's exactly the same ingredients, but because of the rotation, it starts to become appear different uh, color. So you can see it's under construction. This is a vault uh, vent space. Uh, this is a foyer with, you see all this kind of double height, triple height um, facade with uh, rotated windows. That's the uh, a chapel space that frames the um, window of the dome. It's a green that really echoes the, um, the copper roof of the temple. And the sunken garden at the top. These are the GFRC windows. As I said, because of the rotation, it appears differently. And this is the inside. 
Um, I've been working also a lot in Japan lately. This is one of the office buildings in Fukuoka. Fukuoka is a city in the south where I'm actually from. Uh, this is a new uh, office building that uh, is facing uh, one of the most official kind of bank street, but also uh, this side street is now fairly activated as a kind of smaller cafe street. So we wanted to make a building that connects those two characters uh, by excavating the um, uh, corners, like almost like melting uh, ice cube. Uh, and exposing the activities that are quite often in office building, not uh, hard to actually see uh, into. So that the excavated corner becomes pixelized and also having atrium uh, with a kind of canopy underside of the soffit being activated as a signage. Uh, this is how it will be uh, in the big Kind of it stands out because this is one of the first building that after the zoning has changed. So this is a current situation. So uh, it will open this um, um, fall. So you can see this is the test of the LED screen be, uh, behind. So there will be an artist who will be basically coloring the entire soffit and have uh, basically a kind of signage slash artwork looking up to the uh, soffit. Uh, this side is the terraces. Um, we are also working on a high rise about 900 feet in Tokyo uh, for Mori building. Our site was here, this dark blue site, which was behind these three existing building and the new kind of axial street that was developed for the Olympic game. Um, this Olympic, this new axis has a lot of wider sidewalk to uh, have a lot of activities and uh, this existing building that axis actually ended at the garden of the existing building behind so our building was here so what we did was not just to deliver another attached uh, another detached skyscraper but the skyscraper that is dedicated to connect to other skyscrapers so we basically bridged the back of the uh, existing the garden of the, the existing tower and then bridged uh, to our site and even basically kind of penetrate through the center of our building, basically creating this kind of uh, a through public connection through the tower, but not just that, bringing the special program of the tower uh, uh, in the center so that that new axis, the new boulevard's axis is kind of uh, turned vertically up so that that axis is visible from uh, uh, in a wider uh, area of Tokyo. So this the form is like this. So you see this kind of central zone and then you see this bridge that uh, penetrates through the tower. So this is that blue zone. So we thought it's very important that the public space actually penetrates through the center of the tower and then connects uh, different high rises and different developments around in a walking distance. So here you see that the bridge actually going through the tower. In order to do that, we basically made a, a central core, split it into half from the sky lobby so that the, the public space can go through the center. Uh, like this. So that's the bridge going over the street. Uh, the building is also connected uh, to the wider network by because there's a new subway station. So the new subway station gets the new concourse and then the bridge that the bridge I just showed is here. So there's uh, it's quite highly connected in the neighborhood scale, but also regional scale. Uh, bridge structure, which is visible. Uh, this is the underside of the bridge, and this is the new metro station and the concourse. Uh, at the top, we proposed a museum. Uh, Mori already has a museum in Roppongi Hills, but here we propose a little bit more kind of media oriented and media and business oriented venue. Uh, like this, you can do. Uh, you can have a, a forum that has the Imperial Palace at the back of your uh, stage. 
there is a roof garden and infinity pool. It's kind of taking all, all the kind of successful highlights of the uh, skyscrapers in a recent uh, trend. Uh, but uh, here you can see, again, the Imperial Palace uh, visible from this garden and the, and the pool. It's just showing the model. Uh, it's under construction now and it's uh, about to open in 2023. So these are those three existing buildings. That's the boulevard and this is our site. Um, the steel is coming up now. Um, now I would like to go into Chicago. We just uh, uh, won the uh, Deep Discovery Partners Institute at 78, as you know, uh, along the Chicago River and the industri former industrial site. Uh, just to note, the site was, the competition site was here, but the site has already changed after we won. So it's not going to be exactly the same as what we will show, but uh, we will have a programming phase starting actually next week. Uh, this, the site was here again on the, on the competition, uh, which was at the kind of junction of more aligned urban edge versus uh, along the park, uh, along the river. The program was such that uh, labs and offices and common spaces. So we wanted to see the intersection of those three different programs. So what we have done is that office and lab, this below is plan and above is section. Uh, typically in the most efficient manner, maybe it will be organized like this per grid. Uh, we bracketed the co collective space with offices and labs. Uh, so the collective space is in the center of the two and also in section, it creates a kind of vertical atrium. Uh, but as lab is more stringent in the programmatic uh, requirements, so we made offices and classrooms a bit more uh, freer and intuitive because it's also facing the park and the uh, river. So it's uh, starting from this, making a bracket, and then almost making a flower of collaboration, collaborative spaces on, on the uh, riverside. That creates this kind of a shape that is different from different angle, addressing the site's uh, um, basically multi-directionality of the site. And so you see those classrooms and uh, offices that are more free along this facade and then more organized side on the uh, east and south side. Uh, we, we wanted to create a kind of hive of uh, innovation with, you know, the, the tree trunk being the kind of uh, collective space and also the roots uh, on the ground having a much more community facing uh, program because this sits really at the junction of different uh, neighborhoods like uh, Printers Row or Chi uh, Chinatown. Uh, the facade is like that, a little bit like a hive-like. So we basically made a kind of double skin, which uh, creates this kind of buffer zone between the skin and the program inside to have more informal circulation around. So you really see like a kind of beehive and then the public facing program on the ground. Uh, so you see here, um, As I said, on the, uh, on the ground, there's a public facing program like the food research lab, cafe, auditorium, and then in the center, uh, more kind of uh, uh, users uh, space. Um, so we also liberated the entire perimeter so that the building really appears uh, like a building in the park rather than a building that is uh, uh, attached to uh, a building next door. Uh, so this is the double skin side, office side, and, and there's a, a collective atrium in the center. I know there's a sour history of uh, vertical atrium in Chicago, but this was just maybe one kind of potential. I think in the real, in the kind of real uh, effort, we will maybe break up this uh, uh, atrium in the center. Now the plan is such that it's quite flexible per grid uh, of the labs and the offices and classrooms. As you can see, the pink is the kind of collective space. So you have enough breakout spaces around, 
to have an encounters of uh, different users to uh, basically uh, trigger more kind of innovation by uh, you know creating encounters. So this is a facade side having a more informal circulation and breakout spaces uh, that have a great view to the Chicago. So you can see a kind of uh, a shape that is maybe quite distinguished to the buildings around. Um, maybe some of you have heard, but it's already quite a while ago. So I wanted to kind of re um, uh, represent basically the, the Center for the Arts. As you know, the site is at the at the um, northern edge, very close to downtown. Um, we have done many kind of schemes and uh, through the kind of input of the faculty, which was quite useful, uh, we came up with this kind of configuration that uh, what it's two towers, one is for students rehearsal, one is for public facing the downtown, and then a concert hall in the center that creates a porosity between the campus and the city and then have clear kind of faces on both ends uh, that faces public and the faces the uh, students. Uh, that is shaped like this and then the concert hall in the center and then have two parks on the, on the end uh, that creates this kind of synergy or an infinite loop of public and student creating a kind of synergy uh, and um, in, uh, creating an inspiring environment for performance making. The concert hall is a kind of vineyard style, but also creating a central zone that is usable as a black box so that we don't have to rely on the uh, phase three to actually create a black box. So you can actually have some level of black box like space even in the concert hall in the first phase. So this is a kind of rotated square that creates a vineyard like uh, terraces, but actually in the center, it becomes more like a black box. So you can have this kind of um, a day, daytime use, the nighttime typical concert, but you can also actually close the, the rest and create more like a black box like theater. Um, we also enclosed basically loft these two towers and created this kind of uh, zone that is uh, between two skins, almost like a winter garden um, um, that acts almost like a kind of buffer zone between the concert hall and outside, but it's almost open-ended space that is flexible enough for a lot of improvisation and uh, events and exhibitions. Typically, the concert hall needs a double skin. Our idea for, for the acoustic and vibration and all these reasons, uh, our idea was to basically enlarge the outer shell to actually use the uh, space in between two uh, skin. Uh, that creates a kind of uh, interesting shape. And then these two towers actually facilitate the future extension if there is a need for the phase two and phase three. So it's almost like a kind of uh, uh, a system that you can extend uh, even like a food. Uh, so here, the first phase could be like this, but you can also extend and this public tower being the kind of foyer for the two uh, program. So this is what we presented. Uh, hopefully, uh, this will also start soon. So this is a first phase without any theater, just a concert hall and the student and the public tower that liberates two sides as a public space and potentially uh, an extension of the theater in phase two uh, that also still liberates this as a public plaza. Um, I now talk a little bit about the art. Um, I've been working uh, with in different domain in art. Uh, I did collaboration with Taryn Simon. Uh, this was an installation uh, at the uh, Park Avenue Armory, which is uh, uh, 11 concrete tubes 
uh, that each tube has uh, different mourners from different cultures. So it, as a whole, it almost acted like a pipe organ, the different sound coming out as a whole. Um, worked with Kanye to do his seven screen uh, cinema. He shot the short film for the Cannes Film Festival in France. Uh, we developed a system for seven screens to see his uh, film. So it's an existing tent that we hang all the screens uh, like this. Uh, we cut the bottom so that it looks like a kind of floating pyramid. Uh, we've worked on, we've done a, a first phase of the reconfiguration of Sotheby's headquarters in New York, which is uh, auction house in the Upper East Side. Uh, our master plan was to bring all the public facing programs such as galleries and cafes and restaurants at the first four floors rather than creating a, a flexibility through genericity of like one big space, we came up with different spaces. So we wanted to provide a flexibility through diversity of the rooms, which is finished. Uh, typically uh, the columns are the enemy of the gallery space, but here our gallery kind of, uh, different sizes and different shapes didn't really fit to the existing column grid so at some point we decided to expose the columns because there were those concrete columns were quite beautiful uh, so those became a character so you can see here column caps are there but we basically curved the ceiling so but uh, to expose the column cap Um, we've been working on museum extensions. Uh, museum are doomed to kind of extend. This is Corbu's uh, endless museum that can actually extend forever by creating, you know, uh, extending these spaces around. But uh, my personal observation is such that museum extension is facing this kind of issue that uh, you know, there is a higher kind of speed of uh, collections and acquisitions uh, increasing and more and more museum is also dealing with community engagement, public engagement, but there, the speed of actual space that can accommodate those two is much slower. So even if you do one extension, you have to bridge this gap of two increasing um, uh, vectors, which is the collection increase and community engagement increase. Uh, so how to provide such a space? Uh, the, the Quebec Museum is uh, in Canada. Existing museum was in the park. The site, they acquired a site facing the Grand Allee, which is the uh, basically a city, main city boulevard. So what we did was to basically peel the ground slipping the city under, bringing the park above and art being the catalyst between the two uh, and two public area, park and the city. And these are the stacked gallery boxes. As you can see, the roof is also an extension of the park and the city sliding under and creating a new address. Uh, this is a plan of the ground level, which is surrounded by cafe, courtyard, shop, and the atrium in a temporary gallery, column free space. This is a kind of more like a found a lobby space that I'm saying to accommodate, uh, the, uh, to basically realize the ambition of the museum's public engagement. So the gallery is above, but here it almost acts like an extension of the street or the new uh, plaza that can have different programming like gala or performance or music event or even wedding. So for us, this finding this kind of flexible space that is a non-gallery space is quite important, which is often not in the brief because of course, every time museum wants to extend, they actually uh, put um, gallery 
uh, that they need as in the brief, but not necessarily this kind of open-ended non-programmed space. We're doing the same in Buffalo, New York, uh, Albright Knox Art Gallery, uh, existing museum here uh, in the park that Olmsted designed. Uh, the site is here. This is the SOM extension in 60s. It, the museum is hermetic and although they have a great collection, the museum is hermetic and inward looking. Uh, we made an extent, we wanted to make an extension that is in reverse. We put the plus sign um, gallery in the uh, uh, as an extension and create a four corners quite open and then stack flexible gallery on top uh, but we found this space between those plus and the two stack galleries uh, uh, around. So we made this, this promenade that is covered by glass that acts as almost like an observation deck, but also uh, open-ended space that can accommodate different programming of the museum. So Boonshaft, Golden Boonshaft SOM basically made a courtyard art around in the nature in 60s, but we wanted to reverse that uh, inside out to create an uh, art as a core and the nature as a print in the perimeter. So what it does is that it's, it creates a kind of glass case of activity. So every whatever activity you do, like the sculpture exhibition, it also acts as an observation to observe the park. Uh, and most importantly, that the image of the museum is completely different uh, as opposed to very hermetically closed. Here it's completely open and uh, every activity is visible. So what this system does is that you can also use the ex exterior of the museum box. So you, if there's a mural, basically the, the museum's image completely changes or a gala or any events will be quite visible from the existing complex. So highly transparent, which is the image that is uh, museum is uh, tackling with right now. Uh, in the courtyard, we're also covering the existing courtyard. So, uh, so that this will be also usable and collaborating with uh, Oliver Eliasson, Danish Icelandic artist, uh, they, they basically designed the, um, the roof structure. So architecture and art is also quite integrated in this project. This is under construction. Uh, we are also working in, in New York, a new museum. This is a museum also changing, not just a pure museum, but also having incubator also for events. So as all the other museums, new museum is also becoming multifaceted art entity. The site was next to uh, Sana's uh, vertical museum, as you might know. Uh, site was longer and skinnier. This is existing sauna site. We wanted to create something that is not just a kind of a contrast or let's say synergy, or, or let's say like a co easy contrast or easy, let's say, um, mm, respect. So we wanted to make something a little bit more complex than just the kind of uh, typical dichotomy of new and old. So we started to collect these kind of images that are implied a little bit more complex relationship rather than just a kind of binary relationship. Before we started designing like this rocket and the purely infrastructure on the left, but the brief was in a way like almost cloning the existing building. So we first basically kind of cloned and aligned every single program to existing program. So that it's highly connected. What's different is similar to the other project that I showed there. We put the kind of public, public face, which uh, includes like a stair atrium and a dedicated uh, gallery elevators, and then a path to, to the top that really becomes a kind of public uh, circulation, but public domain. Um, this was one of the image we also collected pre-design uh, to really kind of making uh, sure that uh, this new building has some kind of uh, relationship that is balanced to the verticality of the existing museum. 
in the end, it's something like this. So there are uh, two setbacks, uh, one setback at the top uh, to preserve the view from the existing terrace. Uh, that makes the building completely disappear from the ground level to give uh, pay respect to the existing SANA building. There is another setback on the ground to create a plaza at the terminus of the Prince Street that acts as a buffer zone between the two. Uh, this is one of the, as you know, as you might know, the Soho's main street. So this is a terminus of that street. So we wanted to kind of connect, uh, uh, bring that up vertically almost, uh, having a stair atrium and even going all the way to the top. That becomes basically a kind of interface, public interface between the museum and the city that also becomes a collective and also exhibition space. Uh, five more minutes. Um, I've been, we are also working on different scales in the fashion. This is me presenting to Anna Winter. She looks very unhappy, but uh, she, she liked our scheme in the end. We did the Costume Institute uh, exhibition at the Met. Our site was in the um, Lehman Wing which was not a gallery space. So we decided to create a, a building inside the building. This is a membrane structure. We call it Ghost Cathedral. The structure is all this rough uh, scaffolding from the construction site, but we covered it with a very fine membrane uh, that really acts, create this kind of very complex translucency and projected these to these pochets that we created as an exhibition space. Uh, we've recently done an uh, exhibition at the Denver Arts Museum um, in Liebeskin Design Museum, which was quite uh, not, nothing was straight. So we made these cells that really encloses the um, collection for Dior and then used the very raw aluminum panels that are curved, inspired by the femininity of the dresses. Uh, that really uh, enhances the color of the garments that are exhibited in front. With, uh, um, um, we are doing one project in Miami now, which is quite unique. It's called Reef Line. Uh, as you might know, Miami Beach is in the danger of, of course, the climate change with uh, uh, the, the tide and the water rate, the, the, the water becoming too um, high. And so we, there is an initiative to basically create an artificial reef, but rather than along the entire uh, coastline of the Miami Beach, but instead of just putting a kind of industrial tripods to create the, we, we make the coral reef. Uh, there's an initiative to basically use art objects. So this is Leandro's uh, and his cars that are in concrete that will become the bed for the reefs. It's a bit of a cynical art. So throughout the entire length, there will be art objects that uh, are growing the reef. So you can actually dive and see the art, but at the, also the reef at the same time, but also basically protects the beach from the global warming. We were also asked to design uh, art objects. So we looked at the, the um, we focus on the nature of no gravity under the water, under the water. Uh, and also inspired by a lot of kind of sea creatures under the water. Uh, so we decided to use this kind of one unit of spiral stair, which as you know, of course, uh, in the non-gravity moment, stair is obsolete. It's not usable, but stair could be used as a kind of uh, uh, place to basically gather and do some activity. So this is our object that is a collection of spiral staircases that acts almost like a forum, but also uh, looks like a kind of sea creature. Thank you. Sorry, they became a bit late.
Uh, I think um, we will go into the office once again, please. Sophia? Yeah, I'm done. What shall I do? Now, I think I'm connected to you. Now, now it's lost, it says. Can you hear it now? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh. Sorry. Do you see people? No, I don't see people. Are you connected? Yeah. We see, we see you. It looks okay, good. Great. <laughs> Just let us know if we ever um, lose the audio or. Okay, sounds um, great. This is like a collective space. We often do events here. Uh, and we offer people sleeping here after a big lunch. So there are some kind of place. Uh, you can see like mock-ups, this is a mock-up of that new museum project with a mesh facade, metal mesh facade. You can see also one-to-one -one model. I mean, we exhibit models because of course there are certain level of turnovers within the office and it's always useful to have these kind of study models and the model exploration uh, visible to the new, new, uh, new staff. Uh, this is at the entrance. This is the Cornell Milstein Hall model. It's exploded. It's not like the building is floating, but trying to show. Uh, each component of the floor plates, the bottom part, and the roof. Uh, this is a theater we did for Marina Abramovich in the existing building, but because we made a bit, uh, the design that uh, the central auditor the event space is surrounded by different program, we made a model so that we can actually put the head in into the model to see uh, the surroundings. Can you just um... Okay. Um, so this is the Lucas uh, Museum we did in Chicago, which we lost, uh, but it's kind of huge model that is like a kind of section model. Uh, as you might know, this project started in Chicago, but it moved to LA because of the controversy. Uh, this is that Wilshire um, Temple event space project. Uh, we do this kind of model that we can show the section and activities inside. And then some early study models. Um, 
a bit messy here, but the uh, Albright Knox also study models and some samples. Uh, here, a little bit of a kind of samples of really old projects, but again, it's also meant to be a exhibition for the new staffs and also uh, whenever we make models for the new projects, we try to look at what we did in the past. For example, this, this is a tower we did in New York. This is a kind of cast aluminum. This is like resin. This is also resin with some LED. Kind of sculpture. This is all solid wood. And this is the uh, This is under construction. It's a new uh, rental residential project in Greenpoint in Brooklyn quite a big uh, model. It's two towers that almost looks like it used to be one, but cracked. You can also see the complex model. And again, with a different materiality and different studies. This is the bridge park we are doing in DC, which is also ongoing. This is a bridge uh, that is simultaneously a park in this form of X. So you can actually meet at the center, but you can also continue up to a higher point. But also you have a program underneath in the bridge. We're doing a, a project in Houston, um, reusing the huge post office distribution center uh, Houston and making this kind of one of the biggest green community roof uh, on using the big footprint of the um, building, like community garden and the park, but also have a workspace and retail inside but also uh, event venue, which you see here. So you see like the kind of, those are not COVID panels. <laughs> <laughs> there are some mock-ups. I think the mock-ups are just invading the workspace right now because people are not here. Uh, this is our model shop. Uh, where a lot of dramas happen. You see, like the side models, quite well organized tools. These are color, maybe printer. Okay, our office is situated on the 13th floor. Uh, and this is on the north side, but there is also another space on the south side. Uh, 
Okay. Oh, say it. <laughs> Sorry, there are people, but oh, there are <laughs> um, this is the oh, it says it's disconnected. Oh, mm. see. we were still able to see you now. Now we lost the video. Mm -hmm. There we go. Wait, can you hear? Um, Bear with us. So this is that Mori power model. Um, you see all kind of studies. This study looks like a socialist country a project in a, and this is um, the UIC study models. It's very nice. We really like this kind of studies. Um, um, this is the huge uh, new museum model where we also simulate quite in, much, quite uh, in detail how the exhibition can be done and also how the offices and event spaces can be configured. So those are the stacked galleries. This is that public zone and the stair atrium here. And this is an existing building. And you see a smaller scale model again here. I don't know, this is just like cast concrete. This is like in stone. I don't know why we do this, but it's just for fun. Um, and the context model. So it's like a circulation model, like a skeleton. Uh, we didn't really talk about it, uh, but we always make this kind of books for each project. Making book is always quite useful to really uh, understand and create a clarity of the message and the narrative of the project for ourselves. So each project has its own booklet. This is the Dior's um, exhibition model. So this is in Libeskin's building. Here are the, all the cells. Again, a booklet here. It's kind of some nice mirror detail. Uh, this is the Tiffany's um, project I showed you. Uh, you can see different options of the, the top. So here, like more programmatic, like mansard roof to more sculptural form. Um, your exhibition actually traveled to Dallas on the Dallas Museum of Art, which, uh, Edward Barnes building. So this was a vault space. So we kind of reversed the vault to create a kind of public catwalk in the center and the garments on the side. Uh, 
Um, we are doing a post Sandy, um, let's say resiliency master plan for Hoboken in New Jersey. You know, we modeled basically the entire the behavior of the water, how it came into uh, uh, to Hoboken. Uh, so we actually in the phase of almost construction soon, um, these walls to prevent the waters to come in, but that is coupled with public amenities such as benches and information or green or planters, etc. That's, as you remember, Sandy was quite a while ago, so it's finally becoming uh, in reality. You see all this kind of walls. We use the walls to really kind of discuss and uh, simulate certain, you know, um, presentation or narratives. Um, this is the study model for uh, Sotheby's headquarters. Of course, we always present as if the solution came quite uh, naturally or easily, but we do study a lot. For example, this was uh, the scheme that because of the huge footprint, we maybe we kind of proposed to cut into four smaller towers. Um, This one was creating a kind of large atrium in the form of cross. So we start from this kind of sketch models uh, and have a kind of dynamic discussion with the client and then go into slightly kind of larger scale model. Uh, and then finally go into a kind of actual huge model this this you can actually uh, take take it out and show the plans but i i i can't alone uh here our office is at the edge of soho so you can actually see the entire soho soho is a protected area so there will be no tall buildings so this view is kind of preserved and then you, you see the north you see the Empire State Building and uh, you see the Midtown. You can see the Midtown is actually quite uh, tall. You can see the kind of rise of the ground. And then maybe we can go to the... Some biking. Well, there's a construction going on, but hopefully you can see the downtown, the Freedom Tower, uh, etc., on the south. This is the, our building is uh, in the Hudson Square area, which used to be like a printing district. So there's a lot of robust, big buildings around here. Uh, it used to be a kind of uh, for small creative uh, businesses that are uh, housed here, but lately, like Google is now making a new uh, New York headquarters very close to here, and you can see all the new buildings, and it's becoming quite uh, exploited. <laughs> uh, and Disney too. Uh, so. I don't know how long we can stay here. <laughs> Our presence started in like late 90s. So it's a pity we move out from here, but uh, the commercial pressure is quite high in New York around here. Um, so we go backwards, we can end here. Yeah. Or maybe we can have, let's go, let's go back and then.
So now you can turn it off and then. Yeah, I just paused the um, video. Uh, okay, so Sho's going to quickly rejoin on his laptop and then. Oh. Sounds great. Recording in progress. Uh, sorry for the kind of sound uh, issue, but uh, that's that's uh, that's the kind of the office tour. I don't know if you got the sense, but of course it's. Typically, it's more active, but there aren't so many people. So, if I I don't know if there are questions. I'm sorry, I spoke too long, and I no, no, it was it was great, and I know. I mean, we we're so appreciative. I know it's very weird to be alone and not see us when you're walking around. So, actually, if if there are any questions for show, I maybe insist people unmute themselves and ask them so he can hear your voice and maybe see your face. <laughs> it could be a chat format if you're <laughs> too shy. I have a question if no one else has one. Well, I see Walter. Hi, Walter. We, we know. We haven't we we haven't had our whiskey yet. I'm, but I'm grateful you remember. I, I intend to claim it. Yeah, well, I, I have a whiskey from Japan, which is quite rare now. So it's all yours. So I just I just have to go bring that to Chicago. And we have come to New York. But oh, someone no. had a question. You should go ahead with your question, Jeff. Okay, okay. Sorry. Thank you. You mentioned um how you wanted to make less models, and then you showed an image, I think, uh -huh. of people sleeping in the office uh -huh. mm -hmm. and said that was something you wanted less of. So I was wondering yeah. if that's been successful or what so. techniques you have for making people work less. I think it's uh, the slightly uh, kind of mental training that, uh, you know, people tend to make, people tend to think that creating five option represents your skill set a better skill set but if you you know if you make a culture that if you make one option with much attached heart uh, that really reduces the options and reduces the you know, all nighters, etc., because you're much more attached to what you're proposing. And, you know, even that is not selected in that kind of real communication, I find more rewarding and more actually efficient than, you know, uh, soulless five options. So it's really a mental training of whatever you make every day is somewhat really is as if it's your own project, you know? And I think that's, that's being successful, although of course difficult, but I think it's getting better. Um, you know, the blue foam is also, uh, in a way it's easy to make, so it's good, but it's sometimes too easy to make. So people just try to produce too much. Um, I think that's, not good so we are also using mix you know we're sometimes using wood or resin which of course needs much more you know uh time to actually make one single option that means you have to be very sure about what you like right and i think that i also often tell to my students when i'm teaching that you know it's you know the in the schools the teachers tend to or tend to, I don't know, I don't want to generalize it, but um, ask for kind of good solutions, but not really like what they really, really, you know, personally like. And I think that kind of statement of, I really, really like this scheme because of this and this and that, like if you can 
represent your uh, ideas with your heart, I think that's that's the most efficient communication I find. Thank you. I see your paintings on your back, so I'm sure you're quite good at. Okay, any other questions? There's one question in the chat. Um, yeah. can, I, can I ask what is your process of simplifying a complex idea or design? Sometimes details can become overwhelming. So how do you cut to that kind of core? Uh -huh. um, for us, complexity and simplicity is a little bit uh, of uh, not a kind of simple binary relationship. To me, you know, this super simple thing, as you, the question says, super simple form or super simple concept could end up having a very complex detail in order to achieve that simplicity or seemingly complex looking programmatic uh, relationship could actually be resolved with simple, um, I don't know, simple manipulation or simple uh, configuration. So for me that it, it goes back and forth between complexity and simplicity, um, but with this kind of hand gesture that really shows the concept in a single stroke, um, we believe that no matter how complex it is, we should be able to um, explain the project in a kind of, in a way reduced, but in a kind of simple manner. That That's the level we always want to reach because um, I think that, you know, in a way it's a little bit of a kind of OMA school, but that, that really creates this, kind of consensus within different people, different stakeholders. You know, as you know, architecture, there are so many stakeholders. And I think that level of simplicity is often the key to uh, keep the core concept from beginning to the end. To actually show, I had, I had a question. Yes. Um, what we wanted was something that I've seen now in, in a lot of the presentations that you've made. So we wanted open. We wanted very much to open things up. Yeah. And I, it was very vivid in, in the Albright Knox where a lot of us have been and it does have a kind of extraordinary collection. Yeah. <laughs> Although a collection that's not, it's not a super popular collection, right? It's a very distinctive kind of thing. So, I, I mean, I guess the question is, my question is, is opening things up, what kind of value is that? Does everybody, do you think it's a kind of commercial value, a social value? I mean, it's as if there is a kind of common thread in your work, but it's also a response what people want. And that is the sense that things should be more open uh, in a way more transparent. But one also thinks, you know, right away, just like in the room one's in or something, there are moments where openness and transparency and welcomeness are not everything. Um, so I wonder if you just have thought about the degree to which, or you would have thoughts about the degree to which this whole desire to open things up, you know, for good reasons. UIC, we wanted to do it and we, and you did a wonderful job with us. Um, but, but I wonder if it's something that really is a just default at this point. And, and I wonder if it's a good default, if there isn't maybe a way of thinking about things that where openness isn't, shouldn't be a value as such. Yeah, I think the openness, especially in the museum typology and the basically performing arts center and those cultural typology, there is a more demanding uh, openness and uh, typology to be more and more acting like a kind of public domain. But I'm not saying that the transparency and openness in a very superficial sense. I, I think what I'm trying to say is that one direction is a very kind of efficiency driven commercial or refined programmatic direction. So that every, you know, even in Albright Knox, there's a 
clear definition of how the gallery size should be, the proportion of the galleries, etc. So we first provided that, like it was stacked. But then we found that space around to promote the transparency. So we're trying to hit both points. We are not saying like, okay, galleries should be open and gallery or the functional spaces should be perfectly functional and efficient. At the same time, we're trying to create non-program zone that creates a kind of slight uh, open-endedness in a productive way for users to improvise and user to use. So for me, the key is to find that space, not like literally opening up as if that's a kind of only superficial value. Um, so in your case, you are the Center for the Arts too. Of course, the concert hall and the rehearsal spaces, those are very efficiently stacked and configured, but only that zone around the concert hall is just kind of opened up uh, to promote the transparency, but not the, all the other spaces are actually highly functional and um, efficient. So I, I, I'm really trying to find that space because I think the client often they know that they want something like that but it's hard to place hard to actually quantify that space and hard to put that into a brief you know so that's a kind of you know almost given as a extra space and I, I think that also acts commercially to be honest like in Canada the institutions are half private and half uh, public. So the operation budget is provided by public, but not necessarily through uh, like in US, like private donations. So they have to actually earn, you know, create their own revenue. So that event space on the ground actually generates a lot of revenues for them, which of course there is a debate if the museum has to do that or not uh, in a cultural uh, building, uh, but I find it it's interesting that the role of the museum, for example, is changing much more like a church or like some somewhere, you know, people just go there, not for the art, but also to meet and exchange ideas and having that kind of space is um, commercially, but also socially quite uh, important. Thanks, that's totally helpful. Thank you. Show this is Judith. Um, hey, Judith. Hi. Hi. Thanks for showing us around your office. I really appreciated seeing where you work, and I know it doesn't probably feel normal, obviously, without a lot of people in there. But I'm always interested in the ways that architects design their own offices. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering how the design of the offices uh, embodies the kind of larger ideas of the practice and how you've pursued that through that design? Hmm. Um, well, first of all, I don't, we don't have any closed office, so it's all open. So we try not to have any kind of hierarchical representation. So I sit as, you know, with all the other people. Uh, but, and also, you know, this kind of model shop being right next to the workspace, which, you know, creates a much higher frequency of exchange between the physical and uh, what you're planning in the computer. So you're always reminded that, you know, you're not just doing this kind of virtual domain, but you're always doing something physical. Um, here, it's also, Mm. We also often like every three months or so changing the layout or the changing the seats of the people so that uh, it's not fixed so that people really get to know each other. Those, those small things, but I don't know here, um, mm, as I explained at the end, the commercial, we, we want something a little bit more continuous but now we are split it into half, um, which is sometimes not good, but um, hopefully we can 
actually combine those two spaces or find a, a space that is uh, big enough to have one. And I think like Cornell or even your school, you know, it's a little bit, the architecture kind of divides the space in an unproductive way. And then I think in the creative industry, I'm sure, I think it's much more productive to have a singular, as much as possible, a singular space. Um, but also exhibiting models. Sometimes, you know, I feel as if we are so uh, melancholic or nostalgic to our lost competitions or lost like past projects, but it's actually quite useful because the turnover is quite high um, to really learn from what we have done before. And also for new people, you can actually see the, the range of expressions that you can do here because we don't really have a set style per se. We, we really value their own you know, expressions. And as long as you go through a, a kind of process that we appreciate, uh, the output is not um, regulated. So I think this kind of slightly eclectic and diverse environment is quite useful. Thank you. Hi, Shao. It's Rebecca, Hi. the Hi. Um, happy Hi. inheritor of the outcome of our Performing Arts Center uh, contest. I'm so happy to see you. Um, and I'm so happy that you're working on DPI as well. It's just, it's so great. And, you know, after this tour, I was texting Judith, I want to be an architect now. So, um, <laughs> Bob, I'm going to figure out how to enroll. Um, I want to hear about working with Kanye. I want to, I, I mean, I, I also, I just want to hear about Kanye, but I also am just kind of interested about like, how does that work and the fashion work fit with the other stuff that you do? Like, I mean, I will, I'm coming from a place of real ignorance. I don't know if other architecture firms also kind of span that, but that seems really um, interesting. I think the working with artists in general is quite inspiring because they have their own agenda, which is not often bound by a uh, Kind of typical kind of constraints and you know like he just came in he just knocked our door uh saying why is the cinema have always have one screen you know and then we kind of entertain that question of course in history of as you might know there are a lot of people who tried multiple screens but he had this kind of a you know genuine uh, question about architecture why is the cinema having only one screen. And we, we thought that's a kind of interesting question. I don't know why. Uh, and that evolved into a collaboration where, you know, we even developed the seven cameras are rigged into a single thing. So you, you can actually film with the seven cameras at the simultaneously, you know, that's why there's, there was a camera uh, aim that ceiling or floor or the side. So the seven screens actually creates this kind of uh, spherical environment around you. So those kind of interesting questions uh, that arises from artists, uh, from, for us, it's quite, you know, in a way, opening up our minds. And the fashion, I think we love the kind of speed of fashion. Architecture, of course, is quite slow. Fashion, you know, they, of course it's a problematic right now, but like, you know, they even make like six, six collections per year. And then I think that kind of speed gives a fashion uh, in, in a way, a kind of frivolous uh, way of creating certain themes, which I think sometimes architecture I find too serious. So I think that learning from that speed and friv frivolity uh, is very, very useful for us. So it's really like, you know, and I think they want our kind of, you know, little bit, uh, I don't know, stubborn um, head too. So it's, it's really like, um, I think both side wants something that they don't have. But I, I find collaborating with different domains like that uh, always very inspiring in, in a sense that uh, we can go out of our own comfort zone. 
Um, but, you know, collaboration sometimes is a bit overused word nowadays. Um, of course, sometimes there are struggles, but uh, yeah, we, we really try to um, do that uh, as, as often as we can. And I think your faculty, your, your school is really about the interdisciplinary study. And uh, I think that, uh, that that domain interdisciplinarity is not really explore, explored enough in, in general, I think. So I hope that there are continuous effort to really embody that uh, true collaborative effort. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe because there is a silence. Um, we are also um, actually we're making a new, well, our first book, just a book for OMA New York. Um, it's called Search Term. It will be published by Rizzoli in August, uh, sorry, in uh, September. So it's a book of uh, our activities in the past 15 years as I came to New York. Um, the idea is that uh, it's almost like a kind of open source. It's almost like a search engine aesthetic. So you search, uh, it's almost like search term, searching ourselves uh, and having this kind of, you know, like a thumbnail, thumbnail aesthetics. Sorry. Um, almost showing the op uh, our process in a kind of most blatant and open way, which consists of more than 6,000 images. Uh, it will be published in August, so uh, hope we can uh, also discuss uh, um, after the summer. So that was uh, advertisement, um, if there is no question. Exactly. Bob says in the chat book book release. We'll have to, yeah, have a launch party when we can. That would be amazing. Thank you. So thank you so much. This is so generous. Oh, there, there's someone who yeah. wants to Christine. Hi, so, so. It's, Hi. it's Christine. It's a, I'm the director of the School of Theater Music. It's so nice to see you again. I'm wondering if oh, one time, because my question is um, purely um, um, it's not relevant to, to our building or to, um, I'm curious about the reef project. Yeah. I, think about, I think about architecture as being so visual, so visible and persistent. And I'm struck by how that project is not visible to so many and it's being changed by design, by, um, by uh, the environment around it. Um, it's, uh, it's, I don't know what's so fascinating to me about it, except that it, that the combination of that and how it's so secret almost, um, is really compelling. Yeah. For me, it's compelling also, if you know, of course, the history of Miami. And I think, you know, as you know, Miami started as a city for retirement, retired people in a way. Of course, there were original, you know, settlements, but and then it has developed into uh, one of the cultural hub because, for example, my uh, Art Basel came, and also there are a lot of people who, you know, came from Latin America as a gateway to Latin America. So there's a really diverse culture, and that kind of cultural um, investment is now really coming true um, by not just doing a kind of posh museum per se, but there are entrepreneurs who wants to inv investigate the cross relationship of environmental initiatives and cultural initiatives uh, and the social initiatives. And I think that's 
that's coming from a city that is not New York or LA. And I think there is something about that I like uh, right now in US where I think, you know, it's not just Chicago, LA, New York. Uh, it's other cities are also trying to come up with uh, something like that. And I think it really represents the strength of US in a way, in a cultural domain, but also uh, it's interesting how the city of Miami has transformed from, you know, like a beach town to now it's also like a lot of tech, young, young people are moving there. So for me, it's in, in a way, interesting transition also in, in, the, in light of COVID. So it's a little bit different from what you said and the kind of hidden cultural kind of line under the water. But I think, you know, the context for me is also interesting how that happened. Because the, the person who is actually funding or initiating that is an Argentinian woman um, who moved to Miami like 10 years ago and just, you know, almost like now contributing to try to save the entire coastline. Sorry, maybe I didn't. Oh. No, no, no. That's it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting. But that that is supposed to happen this year. So, if you're interested in diving, <laughs> <laughs> but this is also you know like also high line effect. You know everything is becoming a line nowadays. So reef line, underline high line, you name it. So that's also an interesting kind of effect of high line, which is a great public, social, commercial success. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sho, for letting us visit you. We, yeah, now that we have the code to the office, we might be back sooner, <laughs> sooner than you want. Yes. Uh, we really appreciate it. So, yeah, and we hope to hope to see you soon in Chicago. Yeah. Do you know when you're gonna restart your in-person um, crits and so on? We're hoping in the fall, the fall will look a lot closer to what September used to, used to be. Yeah. So we'll have the majority, majority of, of classes. The plan right now, you know, optimistically is that we'll be able to have in person in the fall for, for almost, yeah, all of the studios at least. So. Yeah. I was talking yeah. to Bob before this started that you know, our office is also, you know, you just don't know when to restart. So, because people are so used to be dealing, you know, working from home. So we're gonna have a, more like a party, like a, a week long party, like full of beers and alcohol in the office. So that this becomes like a pub. Um, so that people, people will come back. Because people have to first come back, you know, otherwise they can stay at their home forever. So we will try to do that. So hopefully we can also do that in your school. That sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. That's great. Thank you. Uh, see you soon in Chicago or New York. That's great. Thank you. Bye. Sure. Bye. Bye.